were asking me already, will there be anything on politics? And I say, well, when you touch social issues, of course, politics is part of those social issues. So the politicians are not spared. The politicians are not safe from being the butt of the joke because they themselves provide a lot of material um, to allow a comedian to be able to um, feed off of. And this show, of course, I will not sit and tell you that the politicians are safe or they will be spared. No, there will be some political jokes. And of course, some people tell us, we just came out of Hurricane Irma. Um, people are stressed. What are you going to do for them? Well, this show is exactly what the people need. People need to de-stress. Laughter provides that. Laughter is the best medicine against stress. There's no other medication. You could go to any doctor you want and you could prescribe any medication, give you anything to do or whatever, but the best, the best prescription is a dose of laughter, dose of comedy in the morning, take two again in the afternoon, and before you go to bed, take some more comedy in your tail, and you're bound to wake up the next morning feeling distressed, ready to face the challenges of the day. So um, to answer the question of many people, are the politicians um, safe? No. <laughs> the jokes pretty much write themselves at that point. Yeah, they, 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 write, the, they write the material for us. They're practically so, giving it to us. Social so. <laughs> issues, politics, education, um, family affairs, family matters, um, everything you could think of, we will be touching. And of course, I'm going to do a special about life how we see life, how we disregard life, how we live. And then to tell you in a short, you know, you're born, you go to school, you graduate, you get a job, you go on pension, and you die. That's basically life in a nutshell. Now, what happens between that time of birth and death is very interesting. And you're going to hear about that in a comical way because um, we take comedy very serious and comedy is serious. That's why we took the time to invite you here this afternoon so that we could tell you how serious we take comedy. And I don't want to see this thing die. That's why I'm passing it on. And I wish polit politicians would do the same. Some politicians have been there for 40 years and they could boast about that. But it's time to pass it on, whether to your, your child or to somebody else, but pass it on. There's the only place in the world you could hear politicians say, I've been in office for over 40 years. You should have been retired. <laughs> you know, because you are tired. So you should be retired. But um, we're going to save that all for June 3rd, under the tent at Port de Plaisance. And the difference in this show, again, is the show is on a Sunday. We're going to start at 7 o'clock, sharp. So if you get that 10 minutes past 7, you have missed 10 minutes of the show. The gates will open at 6 o'clock so that you can come in. And um, for groups in particular, you come early so the whole group could sit together. You know? And then at 7 o'clock, we will start. How long the show will last? Well, two and a half hours. But we'll see to it that you get home in time to face um, the work day the following day. I guess that goes back a very long time because um, as a child especially, um, I used to watch my father's um, old DVDs from Ra and Hurricane Relief. I believe I used to watch Hurricane Relief more, but um, listening to the jokes, seeing him there, and I always had a type of admiration for him, um, especially his charisma, and I always thought to myself, maybe one day um, I could follow in his footsteps and do the same, but over time, you could say, I wouldn't say I lost interest in that sense, but it just wasn't something that I was focusing on completely. And um, it wasn't until the last show, Fernando Inya, mm, when I did my performance, where um, it really, it really um, clicked with me that, yes, this is something I can do. This is something that um, I, can, I can aspire to do. I can, um, I can continue the family, the family business, as I like to say. And what ways he inspires me, I would say it goes down more to um, the type of jokes that he makes because 
even though even though um he 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 makes a lot of i like to say jokes for an older audience i i find myself relating to quite a bit of them like i understand them i relate to them to some extent and that kind of had an influence on me in the sense of especially during my, my performance i did a lot of jokes that um that older persons i noticed really that really resonated with the older audience because there was things that they could relate to um one or two of them even told me that they were surprised that i knew about uh certain things that i joked about so i would say yes he 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 has been an inspiration for me especially when it comes to comedy i would say he's the reason that i'm into it in the first place because even if i wasn't doing it uh people say it's in my genes anyway so <laughs> Um, I think that's the truth. Fernando Clark. And I'm Sherlyn Clark. And we invite you to St. Martin's first ever father and son comedy show called It's a Family Affair. On Sunday, June 3rd, under the tent at Porta Plaisance. Starting at 7 p.m. sharp. Gates open at 6 p.m. Okay, since you feel you're so smart, tell them where they could get tickets and for how much. Big D Photo Studio on the Pondville Road, Vandor Bookstores in Simpson Bay and on the AT Ellidge Road, SOS Radio in Marigot, and Arts and Gas Station in Hamel Dupont. And for how much? Only $30. So come out on June 3rd under the tent at Porta Plaisance to see me in action. To see you? No, they're coming to see me. Okay then, come out to see both of us. And bring the whole family. Because it's a family affair. GEBE has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you, whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective, and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, powering a brighter future. Our friend Mega Wadi is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your air code temperature up. Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGEBE. to see the development of the University of St. Martin as you specifically extend your expertise to the building better of the university? So I think for any university, um, it should be able to provide data for the island. It should be able to be the source where government can depend on for research data in general. And being a a scientist per se and, and, and knowing science and loving science and not having that at the University of St. Martin 
I am hoping specifically to expand on the pro programs that are currently given here at USM and take it a step further mm -hmm. into the sciences. Are you um, hopeful that uh, more persons probably will take up science in that they will be able to at least um, help government in developing its data collection in the area of development for countries and Martin? Yes, I think that. I think once we're able to provide those services, then it will become more attractive because right now we have uh, business, hospitality, and education which a lot of people aren't saying are not taking full use of so far. Uh, in expanding it to the sciences, I think that we'll be able to attract even more people that are currently traveling abroad to pursue that. For example, I was one of them. I started here at USM and did my associates in general liberal arts, but then I, I wanted science, and I could not receive that in St. Martin. So then I was able to go ahead abroad and receive those sciences, and in doing so was able to produce data that can be used within, well, for now, for the government of Canada. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I could bring that to the University of St. Martin, where we can be a source of generating that data and providing those services for students. And I'm happy you mentioned um, the fact that you will have to attract as many students as possible coming from St. Martin. Mm -hmm. The question or the um, concern of many persons is the fact that they felt that USM has not been educating our youngsters, especially at the um, secondary school level, um, to let them know at least that USM can also provide or assist with whatever um, subject matter that they might want to pursue in life. Um, how do you go about tackling the situation, particularly at the various um, secondary schools, mm -hmm. to ensure that our students, instead of traveling like your person, mm -hmm. remain on St. Martin and start um, at least pursuing a career from this end up here on? I think it, it starts with really attracting them right now where they are. So going into the schools and, and speaking to them directly on the different programs and services that are being present and being offered to them right now here at the university. So one of the things that we are looking into is <clears throat> doing more school visits and really showing just how much of a jewel USM can be. Because I, I always say it, USM has a, a diverse... <clears throat> alumni body that are not only, for me I went in Canada, but are all over the world and have prominent positions in the world and in Canada and St. Martin as well. There's many people, you know, I go around and I meet all of these different alumni of USM that have really good positions here on the island. And so I think it's showcasing that USM is actually a jewel and can be used to further develop St. Martin. And, and in doing so, then we might be able to attract more of the secondary schools, knowing that they can use USM as a resource, knowing that in coming to USM, they're actually, <coughs> sorry, building their future mm. as well.
KLM, connecting you. People all across St. Martin are switching to a more rewarding experience. The Whip MasterCard Fun Miles credit card, better known as My Card. Earn one fun mile for every $2 spent, even abroad and online. This will quickly get you a ton of fun miles to redeem for travel, shopping, food, fuel, and much more. But there's more to My Card worldwide acceptance, an EMV chip for extra security, and 250 free fun miles with first use. Switch to My Card today at Whip. Of course, and everybody, I'm sure, even though I was a bit late, emphasized indeed that in just about nine days, we will be entering indeed the 2018 hurricane season. And when we were sworn in on January 15, one of the main tasks that we as interim team had was in addition to orchestrating the recovery process, it was indeed to ensure to prepare our island that we indeed would safely go through yet another hurricane season. I think every minister, myself included, has hit indeed unexpected challenges, roadblocks and some setbacks in our recovery plans for our respective individual ministries. We are not where we thought or as, as far along as we wanted to be. I am encouraged, however, by what my ministry has accomplished, they work tirelessly, just like every other staff within the ministry thus far. And what we have in the pipelines in the, in the weeks ahead will hopefully come to fruition in the month of June. Our main priority in these coming weeks, therefore, will be to finalize disaster preparedness programs, organize trainings and drills for personnel and staff, and of course facilitate the further and push the further repairs of as many schools, cultural and sports facilities that we, as we can, to make them as, 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 as least vulnerable to the hurricane season ahead of us. In that light, the Ministry has just completed a few critical documents and actions that ensures that we are one more important step closer to where we want to be. As Minister, I've signed off on Safety and Emergency Management Committee to be established within my ministry, and also the, I signed off on the introduction and implementation of a safety and emergency response guidelines for our schools. Lessons learned through the disaster of Hurricane Irma last September highlight the important, importance of creating indeed a culture of safety and strengthening the structures of emergency preparedness and disaster management in the education sector. The Safety and Emergency Management Committee will become the main organization within this ministry tasked with overseeing the development, the immediate implementation and long-term maintenance of safety and emergency management for the MECI's respective sectors, in all sectors, of course, primarily education, but also cultural organizations and the sports facilities that were heavily impacted as well. The committee's main task, therefore, will be to establish a comprehensive school safety net framework create and maintain plans for disaster preparedness and emergency responses, and manage any crisis within their sectors. Of course, the position of the Secretary General has been recognized. I'm uh, very thankful to our Prime Minister and the, the, the ability that we now have to join in preparedness stages as part of the Emergency Operating Center, and that will help to assist the flow of communication and effective coordination that we need in those stages. Um, in a previous press conference, I went into a little on the safety and emergency response guidelines for the schools, but indeed to quickly recap, the aim of this document is to create, as I mentioned, indeed a culture of safety within the education sector and to ensure that we have minimum guidelines for safety and emergency response planning in schools. The guidelines are limited to the most common hazards like medical emergencies, fire, natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and floods. This will be the first step towards the development of a larger, comprehensive schools safety network, uh, sorry, framework, and it has also been assisted by UNICEF. And that framework should take into account more complex and long-term issues as well, related to, for instance, building standards of our schools, disaster risk reduction education, and green and sustainable approach to school design and management. Um, the, the guidelines highlight a variety of steps. Uh, it is a very comprehensive document, uh, for instance, six steps that the schools would have to follow. 
And just to highlight, it is for all schools relevant to establish the school safety and emergency team per school. To also create awareness among the school community, including the parents, of things that have to be considered and prepared for. They also have to identify all hazards and resources necessary and uh, to indeed respond to an emergency. They also have to prepare the school safety and emergency plan document per school and train accordingly and disseminate the plan and conduct, as I mentioned, mock drills on a regular basis because then it's easier to practice. And they also are required as a very important vital sixth step to evaluate and update a plan where necessary. And once we have these frameworks instituted, it makes it so much easier for the Inspectorate of Education to also follow up to the, the consistent practice of these plans by the school managers and their respective staff. You've also, of course, seen the, the, the use of, of temporary um, uh, schools, the, the so-called pavilion tents. We've seen three uh, that were set up uh, a couple of months ago in uh, St. Peter's and uh, by the Methodist Agogic Center and also here in town for the CBA, for Charles Brooks Academy. And as, of course, the hurricane season approaches, my cabinet, with my guidance, has initiated the process of finalizing how these three donated pavilion tents will be dismantled before the next hurricane season, because they cannot endure any hurricane category one, I am sure. The erection and dismantling of the tents are Extremely is an extremely technical process, and we have enlisted the assistance of a staff member of the Vromi Ministry, who were on hand as the tents were also already assemble, assembled uh, by the Dutch company Intertent um, last year. It was our original intention to have all tents taken down by June 1st, of course, as the start of the hurricane season. However, the Methodist Agogic Center um, school in St. Peter's has asked for permission to continue to use their tent for the rest of the school year until July 1st, to which I of course have agreed, because otherwise it would disrupt and would bring them in, in jeopardy and at risk with indeed a variety of classrooms that, that they use. It's been said that behind every door, possibility awaits. How much possibility depends on which door you open first. Every day, we help our customers discover the possibilities in their lives. It all starts with a conversation. Scotiabank. Discover what's possible. According to our rules of order, I can ask any committee to give me a report of their work. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one. Um, with sending the committees what is supposed to be done by the individual committees, of course I can at some point say, why haven't you? These matters are still outstanding. However, the committees have, in my opinion, nearly a two independent of a role in terms of the chairperson calls meeting, members can ask for meetings and, and they meet. I, in, in looking, looking at the functioning of these committees vis-a-vis -vis the functioning of parliament, I ask myself if maybe in St. Martin's case um, we don't have too many committees because these committees can't, um, they can't make decisions in these committees. Final decisions of Parliament are taken by the Parliament, the body of the Parliament, the entire Parliament. You have a central committee in which matters of Parliament need to be so-called investigated. So the whole idea behind the central committee of Parliament is before something reaches a public meeting of Parliament, the central committee investigates it. 
actually investigates. It asks for the information, calling persons, calling ministers. That's the, the, the operation of the Central Committee. So I have asked myself if having another layer of committees in our small case, 15 members in Parliament, you know, if it's not an overkill. And it is a discussion that as we continue on, I would definitely like to have in Parliament maybe maybe, maybe a few less committees where you kind of group some of the of the, of the of the subjects, you know, and more ad hoc committees with a specific um, task. Well, go and figure out how we're going to get to a new Parliament building, for example. There is such an ad hoc committee, an ad hoc integrity committee specifically. Look at a matter, research, investigate the matter of a code of conduct for Parliament. When you're finished with that, you present it to the Central Committee, a debate takes there amongst all of the members, and then the Parliament in a, in a public session takes a decision on it. So I, so, you know, I look at that in two, in two ways, and I, I really look in looking at the functioning, I mean, 15 members of parliament and all of these committees, some of the committees, we, we had a committee the last time around, according to me, con, um, consisted of two members. That doesn't make sense. You know, and you got four. Imagine a committee go, is going to invite the, 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 the APS, just to mention someone off the top of my head. And you have four members, actually, of the committee. Yes, other members may attend, but it's up to them. The other members of parliament do not have to attend committee meetings. So then you have a, you get a whole organization. Our secretary general need to be there. You know, I mean, the whole work for a committee in which four members participate. Even now, I think I might not have the list itself here with me, but even now, I think we have committees with, with, with four members. It's a good thing that where the committees are concerned, if you have third parties, then you could look at, at factions, the representation of factions. Because otherwise, you know, if you, don't get a, if you don't get a quorum in a committee of, let's say, of four or five members, the meeting of the committee can go ahead. So I don't know, and um, I'm still kind of thinking with it, grappling with it, in terms of the effectiveness of this, um, this amount of committees. I think parliament should basically up its, um, its meetings and its deliberations with or without ministers.